Last talk on the number theory side of factorization. We're going to see some more attacks on RSA, which are also exciting. This one is going to be rather theoretical, so I hope you can bear with me in order to kind of get a yeast of how the number field set works. Um, of course, I can't give you a full lecture on all the details, but I can do a little bit more than just hand waving. So we have seen the, the, the uh, Q-sif already, and that is an example of a number field set. So number fields in general are the integers or Q adjoint some element from the complex number, which is an algebraic integer, Q, which is, an, which is a root of a polynomial over the integers. Now, well, taking Q itself is certainly one of the elements as one of the fields Q adjoins something, so it is a special case of a number field. And so the QSIF factor of 6 and 11, remember that we have these two columns where we have i and i plus 6 and 11, and you can already generalize this instead of just saying i times i plus 6 and 11, we could also plug in some j there. And so, I mean, for the example that you see here, that is the example we had on the slides, that was just running through j equals 1. But in principle, we could see this as a two dimensional problem. And then, well, mod rule 611, no matter what your j was, this is still an i squared. So we have some more generality. We can generate more examples, more rows. And you can hope that if, say, I, uh, j equals 1 didn't work, maybe j equals 2, j equals 3 will give you something smooth for that i. So it means you have to you don't have to go as far down your list, but you have to look at somewhat larger numbers and you have to look well at more numbers horizontally. Now taking the next level up for a number field. So remember if I said a number field is we're taking Q and then we adjoin a root of some polynomial. Well, some polynomial in this case is x squared. Plus, uh, minus 14, so it's a very small, very easy polynomial, but it doesn't have any root over the rationals. So if you're taking x squared minus 9, that is x minus 3 squared, uh, sorry, x minus 3 times x plus 3, because the 9 is a square, but 14 is not a square. So this gives us a square root of 14 adjoined to q. Elements of q adjoined 14 are, well, i plus 14, a square root of 14 times j, so something of the shape that is written, written over here. Now the instructions of how to find elements have changed a little bit. So I'm continuing with having i and j, so two pairs, but instead of just having i on the left hand side, I'm now taking i plus 25j, and the role of this 25 will become very clear, I will become clear very, very soon. And on the right hand side, I'm taking i plus square root of 14j. Also the role of the 14, well it's the same 14 as up there, but the relationship to the 25 will become clear soon. Okay, so now factorizations look different. If I'm now looking at say j equals 3 and i equals 11, or minus 11, sorry, then I'm getting something here. I'm looking at i equals 3, j equals 1, that is this example, and then I have gotten lucky in this case that those two together, if I look at the right hand side, they factor. But now I have to do different kinds of factorization. Well, these things are still factorization of the integers, but for factorizations over here, I'm actually working in Q adjoints 14. So that gets more complicated. So I have to understand how to factor in those rings, but I know how to factor in the ring. So the ring is the ring of integers of Q adjoint 14. But okay, well, we know how to compute there. And so then this clump here happens to be 112 minus 16 times square root of 14, and this whole thing squared. So again, we have something on the left, we have something on the right, which is a square. And we're now taking s, so s is always our left-hand side value. And again, well, we're only taking the first half. 
We're only taking the part which is over the integers. We're not taking the part over q. Why that works, I'll explain in a moment. For now, just see how we get from here, this is the left-hand side of the equation, to here, to this s. That is just taking the first parts, only the i plus 25j, and ignoring the i plus square root of 14j. That's our s, that's an integer, you can compute that. And then is our t. Well, this would be the t squared, but now I'm replacing the square root of 14 by 25. Okay, that is the same 25 as over here, so that maybe sort of makes sense. So I'm doing a factorization over here. Well, I'm doing a factorization of the integers of the ring q h i square root of 14 over here. But then when I get to computing this t, I'm plugging in 25. Now again computing the GCD, and taking this s and this t gives me that the GCD is 13. Okay, this looks rather mysterious. So what is happening here? Why does this work? I could again ask, hey, does this work for any numbers? And of course, you know already when I ask these questions, the answer is no. Um, what we have here is that we have actually a morphism, a map between these two rings. The integers adjoin square root of 14 and the integers modulus 611, which identifies square root of 14 with 25. So why is square root of 14 the same thing as 25 when you're looking modulus 611? Well, if you're taking 25 and you square it, you're getting to, yes, 625, and 625 mod 611 is 14. So actually 14 plays the same role as 25. Namely, both of those are the square root of 625, once taken an integer, 625, and once taken after reduction mod 611, being just 14. Okay, so this map, which is just taking, well, square root of 14 and mapping it to 25, which gets us over here, that is because the 25 squared is 14 in Z mod 611. So when we apply this to this expression here on the left, that means ah, we have the 25 and the 14, both of those turn into 25. And so, yeah, I'm just having squares here again. So similar to I had the i times 611 plus i, which was i squared mod 611. Here I'm having, again, something which then turns into obviously a square. And so obviously taking the first half in my s is fine. Whereas the second half, the reason that I could replace the 14 by 25 when I got to defining t is again this morphism. So when I'm looking at the integers modulo 611, then I'm having that those two things are squares and I can freely replace square root of 14 with 25. However, it helps me in finding more relations, keeping my relations smaller, to actually work with square root of 14 rather than this 25. Now, there is still already a little bit of hand waving because you have never factored in those rings, so trust me on this one, it is possible to compute in there, and yes, we are happy to compute those rings. Okay, once you know it's a difference of squares, then of course it's not a surprise that you can factor. Okay, another view of this, so here we have this diagram, the 625, uh, 20. Sorry, the 625 being uh, 25 squared. So this correspondence here is this map. And then we're looking at the Q adjoint 14 over here. So that's a field running around. So this is a number field sieve with Q adjoint square root of 14. So that's our number field. And sieving again is the way that we would handle those rows by jumping through with difference of two, difference of three, except for now instead of those numbers, we're taking primes in this ring. And some of those primes are just the primes we know from the integers, and there are some new primes, primes that look different because we're in a, well, larger ring. And then over here we have polynomials, z, mod fort, uh, z of x, which we then specialize by replace, uh, replacing x with square root of 14. 
So when we're doing computations on those, we have polynomial arithmetic, we have arithmetic over the rational numbers, but these are special numbers, so z adjoint to the 14. Yes, these are rational numbers, but the coefficients, the i0 and the i1, are integers. And then finally, we have arithmetic model 6 and 11. So that is a lot running around in this diagram, where the main part is working in this color. Well, now we have mastered polynomials of degree 2, we can actually jump ahead to generalize for this. So instead of taking a polynomial of degree 2, which is x squared minus 14, and then this corresponding 25 there, so 25 squared, well, 25 is the root of this thing, mod 11, we could generalize to a arbitrary degree polynomial, say degree d polynomial here, looks like that. I prefer modern polynomial, you can totally generalize this to, to arbitrary uh, coefficients there. It's a bit easier when it's monic, so instead of having some coefficients in front of the x squared, I just have x to the d. And then the second parameter m, that is a root of this polynomial modulo m. Again, this is written a little bit backwards. I normally start with n and m and then find my polynomial so that m is a root. Result is the same, I'm having this tuple, I'm having f and m, so that when I evaluate f at m, I'm getting a multiple of n, meaning, well, it's 0 modulo n, it's a root model. So here I had x squared evaluated 25, that's 625, minus 14, that's 611, which is congruent to 0 mod 611. That's what this slide says. Okay, and then this column here turns into the following. So now I'm having a root alpha of this polynomial, and so I'm having the rational numbers adjoined this alpha. So this is now not a square root of 14, this is a root of this polynomial taken from the complex numbers. There is an extra complication when you're getting to large degree polynomials. It's already an extra complication which you can encounter with quadratic polynomials, namely that there is a ring in between. So this one is not the complete ring of integers of this field, so there is some O in the middle. So that's the ring of integers of this field. So you can have some denominators basically. You can have, well, two as a denominator in the quadratic case, and otherwise you can have a bit more. And then you have this correspondence of alpha with m because modulo n, m is the root of f, and well, over complex numbers, alpha is the root of f. In our example, alpha was square root of 14, n was 611, and the degree was just 2. Okay, so then you throw this whole machinery at it, and okay, here's again what these look like, what the names are. So Q joint alpha, these are polynomials in alpha and we're computing modulo f, so we can limit the degree, it doesn't go beyond alpha to the d, but and the coefficients are rational numbers. The algebraic integers, they still can have rational numbers, but there's a limit on the denominators. And then finally, the z adjoint alpha, these have that the coefficients are integers. So there's a difference here. These are integers coefficients, these are q coefficients, and these have limited denominators basically. And we have this correspondence going from z adjoint alpha to z mod n by replacing alpha with m. And well, you can go both ways on that. Okay, and then we throw the same machine where it is, so then we're getting, um, well, I already commented on that Q is not the same as the Z of joint alpha. I'm again computing with pairs i and j, and then I have the i plus or minus j times something. Well, this m, that's an integer, so I can easily factor it. And on the other side, we had the square root of 14. Well, I never showed you how you actually compute in the integers there, how you compute, how you can factor numbers there. Now, the trick for doing so when you compute in these 
algebraic integers in QA joint alpha, the trick is that you're computing with a norm. And the norm is actually a map which brings you to the integers. So this maps from O, which is potentially larger than Z joint alpha, to an integer number. And over the integers, we know how to factor. And then you also still need to know that some of those integers actually split. So those primes here do not remain prime there, but split into multiple pieces. And so then you can piece together what actually is the factorization of this thing. Now, when you do all of this, and this is the moment where lots of hand waviness comes in, the cost again looks like something, um, well, we had a square root of log n, log log n for the, for the, for the cursive, and now it's again something like this, except for, ah, we're having some different exponents here. It's not a square root, it's a third root on the first part, and it's a two-thirds on the second part. So these are no longer balanced. And it means that the larger part, the log n, is in with a smaller exponent, and the log log n is in with a larger exponent. So the asymptotic cost exponent, after throwing a lot, a lot, a lot of optimization at this, is that the number field sieve costs L to the power b plus little o of 1. So this b is something, okay, this is a theoretical estimate. There's a lot of um, cool number theory going in there. You can also do experiments and can get experiment uh, exponents from that. So the 1.90, this is a theoretical exponent which you can achieve with good choices. Um, and then you have that the runtime of the number field sieve is this L to the power of B. But the main important thing is that in the L, the log N is there with a one third. So this algorithm is actually faster than any of the algorithms we've seen so far. So the number field sieve is faster than the Q-sieve because, and it's faster than ECM, because it's not just a square root of this expression, I mean, x of the square root, it is x of the third root of the dominating factor. Okay, so as I said, this was the last lecture on factorization methods. This is, well, the number field sieve is a crowning achievement. I can't cover as much as I would like to, if you want to see more, I've been giving summer schools uh, with more details on factorization. But this is kind of the overview and the hand wavy, kind of getting the main arguments that I want you to understand. We'll still see some factorization of, of met badly formed RSA numbers, but this was it for factoring good RSA numbers.